Hello, welcome to the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. I am your host, Roy Kessel, and today we are very excited to have with us Tanner Kim from League of Angels. As we're in season seven of the Sports Philanthropy Podcast, we're excited to have new guests and talking about some great ideas and new initiatives that are going on. So Tanner, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're, we're excited that you're here with us. We know you are, are putting together some really impactful work through League of Angels, and we're going to spend a lot of our time focusing on that. But I want to start and back you up to your childhood and get an understanding of, of how did Tanner become interested in sports? What created that, that passion and fire for you? Sure, yeah. It was 100% my dad. Um you know, growing up only child, dad was definitely, you know, like a brother um, and a dad at the same time. We would always go out and play. You know, there was no no sitting inside ever. So he got me introduced to it. But the uh, the funny part about it was as baseball specifically, um, my my mom was the one who wanted to sign me up and, and my dad didn't want to because he, you know, he just it was a football guy and um, didn't want me to play baseball. But obviously they were like, you, you know, you need to try everything. So I, I did pretty much every sport in the book, starting at three, um, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, soccer, you name it. I've, I've done it. So um, he, they, he definitely introduced me to that. Um, both my parents were were heavily involved in, in not only just the sports when once it got rolling, but initially getting me into it. Well, it's it's great because I know that that passion starts from an early age, and and I, I love the fact that you had the opportunity to play all kinds of different sports. Uh, I think that's terrific. Um, you know, one of the complaints we hear a lot in today's sports landscape is that kids are forced to kind of specialize at a very early age. You right. know, so what what's what's the first game you can remember going to? The first game I remember going to, um, I want to say, so I played f for the Cubs when I was super little. Um, and I do remember going to those games just at a little park. Um, and I was actually three and the team was four. And we, we talked to the guy who runs it and um, he, he let me come on a little bit early um, before, before I turned four. So um, I was pretty young going to those games and, um, growing up in, in LA, we would go, my dad would take me to a bunch of Dodgers games. Um, so it's probably, probably a toss up for the first one. I remember either going to a Dodgers game, um, or playing for, you know, just a little T-ball Cubs team, um, when they let me join a little early. So. And, and uh, when you say early, how old were you? I was three. So that's, that's pretty young. And, uh, so when you think about when you started at three years old, what, what were the positions that you loved to play? Um, that's a great question. I know they just stuck me in the infield. I think I was one of the only kids that um, at that age was, was pretty good at catching. So they put me at first base um, and I stayed at first base pretty much my whole life until, until um, you know, growing up and, and getting my later years of baseball. But um, every other kid on the team was four and they let they let me join the team a little early at three. Um, but I just happened to be the kid that could catch. So um, they stuck me at first base a lot. Well, that's a great uh, compliment because that's uh, especially in the younger ages, that's one of the harder positions to play. Right. You get a lot of balls over there and uh, the thrills that are coming across the infield probably aren't the best. So you got to. Right scoop it up and chase after uh, all of those bad hops. So that's, that's great. Um, so baseball was what you started with first and then talk about some of the other sports you played as well. So I played um, football a little bit in elementary school, um, played um, basketball in middle school, um, was in, was in hockey skates. And, and when I was, you know, um, super young. I, I played hockey when, when I was, you know, five, six, seven, um, played soccer at a young age too. Um, if I had to pick my second favorite sport, it'd definitely be hockey just because I was in, in, in skates at such a young age. Um, but I mean, my dad was, was super involved in all the sports. So we would be on snow skis. We would be, um, water skiing. We would be doing pretty much anything you can think of. Um, 
played soccer for a couple seasons. Um, wasn't necessarily my favorite, but still had a blast. Um, was just didn't have the baseball mindset or the football mindset. I'm sorry, the football mindset of just, you know, hit hard. Um, and, and basketball, I just never really stepped into too much, but I, I played every sport at least for, for two or three seasons. Um, but if I had to pick one that, that I had to step into next, it would definitely be hockey. Uh, hockey is a great sport. I, I played right up to COVID. And, and one of the things uh, I love about hockey is you can play, you know, there's a lot of leagues that go on for, for adults all the way up. And when you're on the ice, there's nothing like it, right? You're away from from the phones, nobody's getting interrupted and looking at texts and doing everything. Uh, you know, you're on the bench and skating full out and you go, uh, you know, flat out when you're on the right. ice. And right. And, and the thing I, uh, I love about baseball and hockey both is, you know, you can be a good athlete, but it kind of takes a, a special skill. You can't just kind of throw anybody out in the ice and they can't just skate immediately. Um, you can't throw anybody in the batter's box and they can't just hit a 95 mile hour pitch immediately right off the bat. So it kind of takes a little bit of, you know, um, like a special kind of um, grown skill that you have to sit down and really learn and and, and really work at to be good at. Whereas, um, you know, if you're an athlete, um, you know, a lot of people can catch a ball. A lot of people are fast, but you kind of have to learn a special skill to it, which is something I love. Well, and every sport has its nuances, right? I mean, you you notice that the best uh, pure athletes are not necessarily the best players in, in many sports. Um, right. I remember uh, you look around and there's guys that are super athletic, right? But they're not coordinated in the way that you need to be for, for that sport, right? The coordination you need for hockey is very different from what you need for, for baseball. And in baseball, you know, the coordination you need in the outfield is different from what you need to be uh, a catcher or shortstop or, or third base. And so um, it, it's interesting to see how that all develops and, and evolves at, at, at different ages. So as you grew up, what where did you focus your time? So um, in California, the weather, I mean, is so, so hot year round that it's pretty much like whatever sport you pick, you're going to be playing it year round. Um, and but thankfully, that was one thing that my parents never let me do um, was play baseball year round because baseball is the sport I was best at. Baseball is a sport that I loved, but they still would never let me play year round. So I would take, you know, a couple falls off. I would take a couple winters off to to play hockey, football, basketball and just make sure um that I was kind of touching every area. So, I mean, I, I definitely s focused and spent a lot of my time in baseball um, just because, like I said, that was just kind of what I was good at. That was what I loved. Um, but I really didn't focus my time on one specific sport until probably about late middle school um, going into high school where um, you kind of have to hone in on one, maybe two sports that you want to really give all your time and energy and uh, and money to. So um, I chose baseball, obviously going, um, I, I had my mind made up in middle school, still playing a couple other sports. But then once we, we stepped into high school, that was really my only focus was just getting better at baseball. And so as you progress through, through high school, right, these are probably – guys that you have been playing with for for many years in in the leagues in in your area right uh, what i always found interesting is the the difference in in the growth trajectory right the people who are the best players at you know eight and ten and twelve you know may not be the best players when you get to high school right yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's true. So, I mean, I had a lot of mentors tell me um, at a really young age that baseball kind of looks like a pyramid and, and sports in general where, you know, the older you get, the, the more you weed out and the more people fall off the pyramid until you get to the tip of it where, where the best players are. So um, people would always tell me, you know, stay on the pyramid as long as you can, um, which you can definitely see, you know, some kids that um, you would play with. And it was a little different because since I moved from California to middle school, I hadn't necessarily played with these guys um, in elementary school um, in, in my younger years, but um, definitely late middle school and early high school, um, you start to see people kind of 
falling off and then you know they don't they don't make the high school team or they don't they make the high school team but they're not in the starting roster um and especially going to uh, I'm a baseball program as good as Farragut out in Tennessee um you know it's a it's a top 25 dynasty and they're ranked usually top 10 nationally every year so um going to a, a prestigious baseball school like that you really you really um it tests you and it grows you um in a way that other places might not um because it really makes you kind of cling on to that pyramid if you will um and really try to work hard because you're surrounded by such a good community yeah and and i think that that's something you learn right you learn what it takes to be successful as you grow one of the reasons athletes are in in such demand in the business world is that that focus and discipline that it takes to be successful really at any level right high school college pro you're not going to uh develop those skills in in many other areas and so right absolutely sports absolutely. is really an opportunity to, to to do that so i'd like to turn the page a little bit now you know as, as you went through baseball and, and and jump ahead to kind of the college environment and, and yeah. talk about how that journey went for you um, from a baseball side. Right. So I committed to the University of Kentucky on a, on a good little scholarship my junior year of high school. Um, played there for two years. Um, I registered in my first year I was there. Um, and the school itself is unbelievable. Team was unbelievable. Um, the, the city of Lexington is is like no other um was in a little bit of a lost place um with the sport of baseball honest to be honest just fell out of love with it um and and ended up coming home to knoxville after a series of meetings um, um at the school and with with the ad's and stuff like that so um but the two years i was there i really i had an unbelievable time um i can't complain about the school um, on the team or or the the, the city at all um, it was unbelievable um, you know, the city as a whole welcomed me in for sure. Um, and just, uh, you know, the politics of it and, the, and the, some complications ended up having me come home to Knoxville. So. So now, you know, you're, you're back in, in Knoxville. Um, you know, you're, you're going to school, doing all of that. Where, where did you come up with the idea of League of Angels? Sure. Yeah. So um, I came home to Knoxville um, and had about a month month and a half of just kind of feeling lost and um you know back home with with family obviously was unbelievable but making that hard decision to step away from baseball and, and really not not really knowing what i was going to do with school um i just really started you know trying to figure figure not only myself out but figure out what was going to happen next and during that time um, i was going to city hills which was as a church right off of paper mill here in knoxville um and um, I was just going going religiously, but but not really feeling super connected in any way to the city. And then um, about mid July, um, I was sitting in a sermon, and he was just talking about swords and talking about um, how you might have put down a gift that God's given you, um, and it might be time to pick it up and use it for Him. Um, so I mean, it was just kind of in that moment where I just really felt, you know, the voice of the Lord telling me to start um, the nonprofit um, and just have a baseball foundation. Um, for special needs individuals and I didn't really know what that looked like or what that was and I really wasn't going to step into it at all um, but I, I felt like the Lord called me to do that um, and I sat on it for about a week until I came down downstairs and told my uh, my parents that hey I'm, this is what I'm going to do um, and they were they were skeptical at first they were they were um, you know because again we don't, I don't have any family members with special needs I don't have any friends or um, you know, I wasn't even a peer tutor in high school, so I really wasn't in that environment at all. Um, but again, just like they, they've always been, they were like, we're going to support you through it. Like, what does it look like? Um, that same that same little voice in my head um, told me to start it and, and, and told me to, to call it the League of Angels. Um, so I set up a couple meetings around Knoxville and just to, um, see what it would look like to teach and play the game of baseball with, with people with special needs. And, and then just decided to be obedient to what to what God's called me to do. And it's been awesome, uh, you know, allowing myself and, and the people that I've been involved with to use um, the gift of baseball that I know that God's given me, but use it in a different way. Well, that that's amazing. You know, and, and I think what's really, really interesting is you talked about the fact that you don't have 
anyone in your family or that you're directly connected to with special needs, right? Mm -hmm. I think most of the people that have <clears throat> followed the Sports Philanthropy Network know about my sister, Sharon, who, who was born with, with special needs, developmentally disabled, and um, has done amazing things and um, amazing uh, ray of sunshine in, in so many people's lives. And um, it's interesting to me that that's what, what you would have picked right, without having that prior exposure and, and interaction, as you said, you weren't involved with, with tutoring or with any of the other opportunities. So, you know, when you got started, right, you're really learning this whole area from scratch because this wasn't something you knew about. Right. Um, it's just what I feel, you know, the Lord has called me to do and he told me to start it and I have to be obedient to what to what his plan is for me. So, um, like like you said, yeah, I have no no prior experience, no no connections really with that community. So um, I, I I just talk with the connections that I did have in Knoxville in the baseball world more, um, and then that led to you know God's hand just being over me and guiding me where I needed to be um, with with different meetings and, and talking to different people and connecting to different people. Um, whether it was you know a, a local a local just you know child care center for special needs or I mean amazing people around, around Knoxville and even you yourself um, even being in this podcast so um, it's been awesome just stepping into the the call that he has for for this chapter of my life and um, it's it's been a it's definitely been a wild ride to, to learn new stuff just about business in itself and also um, meet so many amazing families that have been a part of the League of Angels family of. Um, you know, making sure that, you know, our slogan is baseball for all, um, making sure that, you know, these kids have an awesome experience and making sure that these parents um, get to see their kid in a new lens as well. And also the the community of Knoxville and hopefully um, the U.S. as we grow just to just to be able to see um, baseball and these kids in a new way because they are um, so amazing. And I'm getting to learn so much and seeing so much myself, too. Well, I, I think what's interesting right as we work with so many different types of organizations is looking at how people rally the support for for the work that they're doing right <clears throat> and a lot of that comes from your energy and, and your passion because people can feel that you know in, in having right. a conversation with you right they can look into your eyes they can see that you really care about this you're really passionate about it um and that's one thing you know we we give a lot of credit for as you're doing this because you had a choice of all kinds of things um, in today's world with attention spans being so short, right? A lot of people, you could say, well, I looked at this and I did this for a couple of months and I changed my mind and I did that, but you really dove into this from, from the beginning, you know? So, so take us through that, that journey um, and talk about when you, you know, when did you start League of Angels? Sure. So again, like I said, I had, the, um, you know, the Lord, you know, spoke to me and told me to start it in about middle of July um didn't really know how that was going to look so i set up a couple meetings in august um with some local people at d1 have a great great buddy of mine devin driscoll um, who owns the d1 here it's a training facility and had a meeting with him and he connected me with a couple amazing um, special needs organizations in knoxville had a couple meetings there and basically just sold the idea um ha had no idea how to start a nonprofit, how to run a nonprofit. Um, or even what the League of Angels would look like. You know, all, all that God told me to do was start the League of Angels, and it was going to be a baseball foundation to help teach and play with special individuals. So um, that that turned into having a little demo day in October of last year, which was like, hey, what is this going to look like? Um, how do we set up the events? How do we get kids and volunteers there? Um, once they are there, what do they do? What does it look like? So we had a pretty amazing demo day back in October, and it went phenomenal. We had we had close to 15 kids and um, close to 50 volunteers for our first event, which was unbelievable. Um, so once we kind of saw how it looked and saw that it would really work, we, we um, dove into the more of the paperwork side. And I can't take any credit for that. You know, God God has you know put so many amazing people in in, in my life and the people around me's life. So to to make this really go smoothly and to really get it off the ground. So. The paperwork was done um, in December, and then we were like, look, let's just try to have an event a month, keep trying to make the game look differently, keep trying to make the event bigger and better, um, and, and we don't want any event to look the same uh, with the same goal and mission of um, just, you know, providing the service to these kids and these families and the, the people around us, because 
Um, it's arguably more um, beneficial for the volunteers who get to come see in the community who see a baseball and these kids in a different lens. Um, but it also obviously is to serve these kids and um, make it super inclusive and fun, but also modern, because I think that's what we have on our side as well. So we're, we're sitting here recording this podcast, right? Summer of, of 2024. Um, tell us what you've got on the horizon for the next 12 months. What are your plans? Yeah, so we, we have an amazing new advising board that we've kind of gotten connected with, with a bunch of amazing people. Um, we're actually in the works right now planning our first League of Angels Festival, which is going to be awesome. That's going to be August 24th um, from 430 to 730. And we're going to get um, we're hoping for the, the food trucks and the vendors and the bands and the music and just just dress it up to to get the town of Farragut and the, the city of Knoxville more involved with the League of Angels and just spread awareness, raise money, whatever that looks like, um, just outreach in general. Um, to obviously have a, an awesome, fun festival that's hosted by the League of Angels, but also have a lot of people come and see see the game. Um, we're going to have an exhibition game, which is going to be a, just a normal League of Angels event where we're going to dress it up, try to make it different, try to make it new, get as many kids there as possible, as many volunteers, and then have the city of Knoxville um, come out. To, to, it's going to be at Mayor Bob Park, and we're just going to – we're going to dress it up and make it look uh, as good as possible that we can and um, to get as many people there as possible to see the game um, and just be involved with the League of Angels overall. Terrific. Well, we, we look forward to supporting that and seeing how we can help, uh, you know, enhance that event and, and promote it and, and get some additional uh, people to participate there. Uh, great Absolutely. work that you're doing. We look forward to continuing to follow that work uh, um, and, and commend you for all of the efforts you've taken in such a short time to get this off of the ground. So, but before we wrap up here, we want to kind of turn into a little bit more of a lighthearted topic here and, and throw a curveball question at you and, and say, if, if you could be commissioner of any sport, tell us what sport you would choose to be commissioner of. Um, I hate to, I hate to be cliche, but I feel like I'd have to become the uh, the commissioner of baseball, um, and just use that um, all, all my knowledge I already have and, and take it to that same sport. So now uh, we'll go to the next step. Then on the follow up question, you've uh, you've kicked Rob out of his office in New York, and you've taken over the headquarters for for MLB. Right. So what what's the, what's the first change you're going to make? Um, I'd probably, um, if I could make one change, I would make it a little bit more of an event as, as, as weird as that is to, to carry off of what we've been doing at the league of angels, but, you know, throw some more lights in there, throw some new rules. Um, I know that banana, Savannah bananas have thrown in a lot of crazy new ideas and crazy new rules. So, um, not we. I never want to get away from the traditional game of baseball because um, that's what everybody knows and loves. It's America's favorite pastime. But um, maybe maybe throwing in some more lights, some more music, getting the crowd more involved in some way. Because um, I think um, obviously the players are awesome, but we want to get um, the whole. I mean, there's you know tens and thousands of people that come watch it every game, so get them more involved in some way. Very cool. So you're going to turn it into the live golf version of baseball. Uh, right. With all of, uh, the music and, and everything right. ranking up on that. So, um, well, that, that's terrific. I think it would be interesting to, to see the creative ways that, that you have um, to enhance the game, right? I think they've taken steps with the pitch clock and other things to right. try to speed it up because they know people's attention span to sit for a, a three and a half hour baseball game is, is, is limited. Um, you know, we've seen some great efforts to enhance the fan experience uh, around the ballparks and around the games. And so I, I think that would be a great opportunity. So, Tanner, thank you so much for coming and joining us on the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. We, we appreciate all the hard work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And for all of our viewers and listeners, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to Join the Sports Philanthropy Podcast, reminding you to live generously. This is Roy Kessel signing off for the Sports Philanthropy Network. Have a great day.